welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and things to come if we can find out about them. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And I am joined by my two regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hey, everybody. Right. And Steve Marinucci, uh, the Beatles reporter extraordinaire for Billboard.com, Variety.com, Axis.com, Goldmine, and various other places, and also the author of the book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Right. Hello, Ken. <laughs> Hi, Steve. <laughs> and um, we are going to continue our discussion that we began last week with Kid O'Toole, the author of the Deep Beatles blogs on Something Else Reviews and um, the songs we were singing about sort of deep Beatles tracks um, and things that people sometimes skip or miss or don't know quite as well as the hits. And um, last week we discussed her uh, five selections of Beatles tracks that she thinks are unappreciated. And this week we will move on to the solo tracks. Um, But first we have a number of news items including some news about Ringo. Which of you wants to begin with that? Well, I guess I will, since I wrote the the story. Um, Ringo released his um, latest uh, music video this week, for or last week, for Give More Love. And I did a, a little story about it, uh, talking about the making of it. And that's and, in Billboard, uh, Billboard.com? That's, in, that's on Billboard.com, yeah. I... I Got some information from Brent Carpenter, the videographer for it, um, and it was fun talking to him actually because he told me a few things that probably you wouldn't know, um, like the the little wine box that that Ringo uh, uses at the in the video. He said that uh, the way they found that was in a hotel gift shop, and Brent said he he said you know that would be fun to put in a in a video and Ringo said well think of a way to do it and he did and uh, they also I love the way by the way that they use the black and white graphics on the on the band those were uh, rehearsal videos by the way but um, I love the way they did that it made the band look really sharp uh, it's a great little video and it's on it's on YouTube if you haven't seen it already Ringo also announced that. Uh, he would announce the plans for his uh, annual uh, Peace and Love uh, birthday celebration is going to be um, at the Hard Rock Cafe in Nice, France during their upcoming European tour. Um, and, of course, this uh, between now and the 1st of October, they're going to be in – Europe, and then they're they're gonna they're gonna alternate between Europe and the U.S. He's gonna do one date uh, at Atlantic City before they go to Europe, and then later in the year they'll they'll be doing a bunch of shows in the U.S. with uh, Graham Goldman and um, Colin, Colin Hay. Hay. And one other thing that that I asked him that uh, was uh, I think somewhat newsy was I said, uh, "Is there a chance that you guys are gonna record any of these shows?" And he said. When they change lineups is when they do recording. And he said he belie- he believes that they will do some recording during one of these shows or during some of these shows this year. But he did not know, obviously. I mean, there are no specific plans to, to release anything yet. But that was, um, that was something that uh, was newsworthy out of that uh, story. So, but, he, but he wasn't we, well, signed you, on to film any of them. Yeah, he will be. He will be filming. He said that 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 yeah that they that they film, like I said, they film when they change. You know, when the when the band lineup changes. So and he will be filming, but what they do with it, uh, or he said uh, the quote I actually have, and I'm looking straight at it. It says, "I hope we'll be shooting." He seemed pretty confident though that they will. So it'd be nice to see a, a new DVD, a uh, live DVD, because it's been a while. 
Right. You know, Ringo's put out several live DVDs of the All Stars and their different lineups, but the last one that I recall was live at the Ryman, and that's right. that's several years ago already. Well, they also had the they also had the access video uh, from um, uh, I think it was Fort Worth. He said that, and that won't probably that probably will not be released. Hmm. Uh, so, and there's also a possibility, and and I'm and I'm probably going out on a limb by saying this. That uh, there may be a second show in Atlantic City. Maybe. Uh, apparently, there's there was a listing that uh, uh, dropped in on the Atlantic City uh, on the website with Atlantic City, and then it was taken off. So there may or may not be a second show coming to Atlantic City for those of you in that area. So you might want to keep an eye out if you live there. Right, and that's the start of the tour. So that's anyone start, that goes. That's right. That's the that's June second is the one scheduled show. Yeah. So if, it'll if be. You go to that show. You're going to know the the set list. That's right. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's Before right. anybody else. That's and right. You can celebrate the 51st anniversary of the U.S. release of Sgt. Pepper. There we go. There, there we go. So. So Ken, did you go to Record Store Day? No, I did not, Alan. <laughs> but um, we didn't have any news items about record store day in our last show because there were no beetle or solo beetle releases however i since learned that there were a couple of releases that are of interest to some beetle fans because um uh, harry nilsson's album pussycats which was produced by john lennon was reissued on vinyl for record store day Mm -hmm. that's from the label called real gone music and there was a, a george martin release called beatles to bond and bach and um, it includes several things. A piece that was written by George Martin, which is called Theme One, which he apparently was commissioned to write for BBC Radio One. Mm-hmm. There's something in there called the Bond Suite, which uh, includes different arrangements of the James Bond theme mixed with uh, kind of a groovy version of uh, Live and Let Die. <laughs> and there's something called the Beatles Suite which has orchestral sounds of Beatle classics. And I think you have song titles there, or one of you does, of what uh, is covered there. Uh, But this comes from the label called Music on Vinyl, and uh, they made a limited number of 2,500 copies that are individually numbered, and they're all on 180-gram blue vinyl. Mm -hmm. So were you saying, Alan, uh, this is before we started the show, that this... This might have been an early release back in the 70s. I thought it might have. Um, I, I read that it was released in 1974. Um, okay. But I don't remember seeing it. So, uh, you know, could have missed it easily. Uh, mm. I'm going to I'm gonna have to try and find a copy of that now. Okay. I didn't go hmm. to Record Store Day either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the information on the Record Store Day website, and it says... Uh, exclusive release. I I don't recall hearing of this, but uh, then you know, what can I say? But uh, it doesn't. The title doesn't ring a bell with me. Mm, not um, to me either. Yeah, I'm. Uh, the interesting thing is that I'm like most of the most of the music on here is is Beatle related, really. You know, because he's got the they've got the Beatle suite with the Pepper tracks and the Yellow Submarine su- suite with the with the Yellow Submarine tracks. So. Um, well, and, and then, and then did li- actually, li- you, know, you know, die a couple of years ago, so it can't be a new right. recording, right? Um, right. So, and, and I doubt that there's that much unreleased George Martin. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure anything he recorded, he probably would have released. So, mm-hmm. uh, my impression, you know, looking at it, was that it was a compilation of of things. Probably. But, um, but yeah. That um, didn't, and and those tra- the none of those maybe except for maybe theme one, and maybe Elizabeth and Essex came from the the Martin box set. I don't remember. I I, I don't recall them being on the Martin box set. Mm-hmm. So, but anyway, okay. Okay, so there Ken, we you were also telling us about the Eric Clapton documentary and its various spinoffs, which have some Beatles content. Yeah, there was a documentary that was um, just programmed on PBS channels recently called Life in 12 Bars, and it's being released on DVD and Blu-ray, and there's also going to be a two-CD compilation that spans Eric's career, 
and also a 4LP version plus digital formats. And um, I did get to watch this documentary when it was on PBS. Did either of you guys watch it? No. No, I haven't. I have a uh, digital file of it, but I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Well, it has its merits, although I I did have one major problem with it. It did um, cover very heavily the beginning of Eric's career, his childhood and and all the bands he was in, from uh, the Yardbirds through uh, Blind Faith and Derek and the Dominoes, obviously Cream and John Mayall, and... um, it's it's really interesting. I mean, it's very thorough. It goes through those years very well. It deals a lot with Eric's uh, drug problem and alcohol problem and his infatuation with Patty Harrison. And um, the only problem I had with it was it's kind of similar in a way to living in the material world, the documentary, because after, say, the early 70s, it just kind of whips through the rest of his career. So for anyone that grew up on a lot of the, the 70s music of Eric Clapton, like I Shot the Sheriff or Lay Down Sally or any of those, all those albums, 461 Ocean Boulevard and Slow Hand and Another Ticket and any of those albums, if they meant anything to you, they really breeze right by that whole part of his career. Mm-hmm. And um, they talk about the death of his son. But um, it is kind of well done in, in a lot of ways. I was very surprised. One thing that I didn't really know about Eric was that he apparently was very close to Jimi Hendrix. And um, he had said something to the effect when when Jimi died, it didn't upset him that he died. It just upset him that he didn't go with him. Because at that time, he was really depressed. And uh, I think a lot of that had to do with, you know, his love for Patty and how to deal with it and dealing with drugs and alcohol. And um, so it's it's kind of depressing in a way watching this documentary, but it's also uplifting to see how he comes out of it. Mm-hmm. So um, you know it's certainly worthwhile seeing this documentary. And um, I do know that the the uh, the music compilations will actually include the Beatles recording of "While My Guitar Gently Weeps," since Eric is on it. It's kind of surprising because you rarely ever see a Beatles recording on another release. Right. of some kind it also has badge which of course of course um george wrote with eric clapton and there is a recording of my sweet lord on there although i don't know if that's from the concert for bangladesh or from live in japan so it does have three harrison related uh tracks on there and it's all coming out may the 25th the videos and and the audio okay that sounds good and I think there were also a bunch of books coming out, and Steve well, has a I, list of those. Yeah, actually, actually, there were a couple of events that I, I wanted to mention first. Um, okay. There's a, a Beatles White Album 50th Anniversary uh, International Symposium happening in November at Monmouth University in uh, New Jersey in West Long Branch. It's going to feature a bunch of Beatles scholars, uh, including Mark Lewison, who's the keynote speaker. It's going to have Walter Everett, John Kovac, uh, Tim Riley, and Robert Rodriguez, among others. Ken um, Womack. Ken, Ken Womack. That's, Ken, that's Ken Womack's, yeah, that's Ken Womack's uh, university. So he's also involved. And it's, it, that, should be, that should be a lot of fun. That should be a, a, a very interesting. And um, they have information on their website uh, uh, about that. So if you're if you're interested, uh, you know you can look that up. Um, it says that there it will also include uh, live acts and uh, uh, live acts as well. So, but that's gonna uh, you know that's gonna be one of the one of many 50th anniversary white album things going on. But uh, that should be a that should be a big deal. That should be a big deal. Another white album. Uh, uh, related thing is that the White Album collection that is currently at 1,987 copies is now at the KMAC Museum in Louisville through August 5th. Uh, Alan, you said you've seen that. Yeah, um, yeah, and I interviewed it. This is a this is an art piece, really, by an right. artist named Rutherford Chang. Right, and I believe it's called "We Buy White Albums." <laughs> Um, and he, uh, you know, he, he's a young guy, but growing up, um, his 
parents used to play the White Album, and he got fascinated with it, and he started buying up as many copies as he could. And um, what his installa- it's an art installation. What the installation is, is basically he gets a room and sets it up as a record store. Um, it's just that the only thing in the record store, you know, in the browser bins, on wall display, you know, where, where you go into, used to go into a record store and there'd be like, you know, albums all along the walls. They're all the white album. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, and basically one of the things that fascinated him is what shape these white albums were in. I right. mean, I think he's particularly interested in original pressing white album so that they have the number and he has a catalog with all the numbers he has and and everything and uh you know but um you look at some of them and there are some where people have done drawings of their own there are some where people put their name on it you know you know the way people the way people treat albums who don't you know realize that albums are you know what they are like i i've never written my name on an album okay you know it's like it, this yeah. thing has to be in as good condition as it can possibly be but apparently there are millions of people who don't believe that and um rutherford chang has a lot of their white albums another thing that rutherford chang did as part of his project was that he got a uh, a recording set up in a turntable I and mean, when you go into the, the exhibition the white album is playing naturally um, and it's not going to be the CD. It's going to be one of the LPs in his collection. So, you know, there'll be some clicks and pops and things. But what he did was he rec- – he, I don't know if he's recorded every one that he's gotten or or how much he's you – know, when he gave up recording them. But he began recording a whole lot of the White Albums he had um, over each other. You know, so so he had a multi-track recorder, and first he would do one, then he would do the the next one, starting it in sync. And because it's a an analog turntable, it goes out of sync, you know, fairly quickly. So while it starts out unified, um, by maybe ten minutes in, it's a complete mess. You know, you can <laughs> you can sort of hear the resonances of the songs in there, but but so it's an audio project too. I'm not sure whether he is still doing that. Um, he did have a uh, two disc album LP pressed with the recording that he made, and uh, also overlaid some of the graffiti on various covers for his cover. So it's not actually a completely white cover. It's got stuff all over it. But, uh, how does he how does he keep people from taking those albums? Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, when I went in there, there weren't a lot of people in there, and he he just I suppose could keep an eye on them. But I suppose someone could do that. Um, it's yeah. I don't know why put this idea in people's heads, Steve. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not trying to. I'm just uh, having. <laughs> no, I've seen a, the a logical question. Yeah, I I've, mean, maybe they have some security. I, I, I never asked him. It didn't. It didn't occur to me. But they, they must have some sort of security for it. Right, right. But yeah, I mean, the the, the whole idea of of doing that as an art installation, that's almost something that Yoko would dream up. You know, absolutely, it's, it's true. It's, it and and that's really the cool thing about it. You know, that he. That he came up with this on his own, you know. Yeah. The but, fact that it's a plain white cover, you can do so much with it. That's right. I mean, if he did the same thing for Sergeant Pepper, <laughs> there's not so much you can write on the front cover of Sergeant Pepper, you know. So, uh, but with white, nothing but white, you know. Yeah. The sky's the limit. You know? right. right. And it and it invites it invites a, well, I mean, the the cover itself, as it, you know, as we've talked about before, the cover itself was basically kind of an art thing anyway. Yeah, you know, so yeah it was done that... by a, a recognized artist, Richard Hamilton, who was uh, you know pretty well known at the time. He is, really still is. So yeah, you've got an art piece about an art piece. Right. <laughs> right. It's so that's meta. Pretty... I, <laughs> it is. It is. That's pretty. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. Mm. Anyway. Okay, so there's that. You, you have uh, any other shows, or do you want to get? I, well, I also I also have the I also have the fact that 
they've put the uh, theater listings for Yellow Submarine online okay. at uh, yellowsubmarine.film. And also, uh, just a, a, a small a news item, um, I saw uh, Bill Harry actually mentioned this online, and I confirmed it, that uh, George Martin's widow, Judy, burglars broke into her home, but police arrived and they escaped, and she apparently was not hurt, but uh, it was kind of, she locked herself uh, in uh, a bathroom, and and uh, they got away, so... Uh, but uh, that's kind of that was kind of a scary thing. Uh, but she's apparently okay. So, but I do have I do have a bunch of books to mention that are coming out between now and the end of the year. And there's as usual, this is around the time of the year when we start hearing you know books later on in the year. Um, the one I did see a couple of mentions about on Facebook is one called Visualizing the Beatles. It's kind of a graphic novel of chart of charts about the Beatles. Going from you know from Beatlemania all the way through to Abbey Road and you know having there's all sorts of stuff in here. It's called a graphic history of the world's favorite band and it's got it goes through all the albums. It's it, it's it's really kind of strange actually, but uh, that's that's one. Uh, it talks about uh, one of the charts talks about all the instruments they used. That was one that uh, got uh, some advanced focus in one of the stories. But that's that's one. There's another one called Fab Four Mania by, by Carol Tyler that's coming out in June. That is a kind of a diary uh, uh, of a 13 year old girl talking about Beatlemania as it's happening, and that's kind of that looks to be a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of period stuff in there, and that that looks to be like it's going to be a whole lot of fun there are others too there's uh, one called robes of silk feet of clay the true story and i kid you not the true story of a love affair with maharishi mahesh yogi and by judith bork b-o-u-r-q-u-e and that's coming out in september there's another one called images of broken light by michael DeLeo uh, about uh, a novel about the days before the uh, the death of john lennon there's volume two of Ken Womack's uh, bio of George Martin called Sound Pictures. There's another one called Advertising Revolution, the story of a song from Beatles hit to Nike slogan by Alan Bradshaw and Linda Scott. There's the American ver. I'm not sure if this came out in America before, but it's not it's not a new book per se. It's called The Making of John Lennon by Francis Kenny about the early days of John Lennon. I uh, um, there's at least one and probably more Yellow Submarine books coming out. And there is also the reissue of the Complete Beatles Recording Sessions by Mark Lewison. And I asked him this week whether or not he uh, this is a revised version or if it's the version that has been out previously. And he said it's the revised version that's been out previously. He has nothing to do with this. He did say that there will be updates incorporated in you know, in his the upcoming uh, volumes of his Beatle biography, but he is not. This is not a revised version of that, and that will be out in September. So, okay, there's a few I have listed. Okay, uh, one of which is by Ray Connolly, hmm. called "Being John Lennon: A Restless Life," which is coming out in October. I don't have any information about what that book is about on John. Then there's also one called "The Roof." The Beatles' final concert. That's by Ken Mansfield. That's the uh, Apple Records' former U.S. manager, and um, he brings an insider's perspective on the days leading up to the 42-minute concert. There is also That's, there's already a rooftop book by somebody that I don't believe had any connection to it. Yeah, his name uh, is, is and, Tony Barrel. Right, <laughs> and and there's been, and there's been some discussion, yeah. and there's been some discussion online as to how much informa- new information he actually was able to get. I have not seen the book, so I don't know, but there is one out there already. But Ken's obviously would have a better, you know, would be a somebody who was there and who that's was, right. Was he know, there? Who, yes, yeah. he was. Okay. He was. So and that book that book's coming out November thirteenth. And Ken and Ken's done other White albums uh, or a. Rooftop stuff before in his previous books, but this one specifically is about that. So, um, also, uh, uh, get. I was just going to say that um, actually I I looked at the Tony Barrel book 
this afternoon. I have have a copy. I haven't had a chance to read it all yet. But he he does talk about um, having interviewed um, Apple secretary at the time and and someone from the who was one of the policemen at the time and so it, it i don't know you know had not having read it i don't know how much he got from them but it it does seem that he you know did do some research and interviews so it okay. might be a, a different perspective from ken manfield's but um you know if you're fascinated with the rooftop now you have two books to read true <laughs> okay, okay. Um, also, I just want to make a quick mention that if we have any Smithereens fans listening, and I know we do, they will have a, a new CD coming out called Covers, and it's just a, a compilation of hit songs, mainly from the 60s, and there's a lot of Beatles songs that they cover. They also cover Ringo's It Don't Come Easy, as well as uh, some songs from the Kinks and the Who and the Beach Boys. So that's late May and early June for that. Is this a compilation of stuff that was already out before, or is it stuff recorded um, ideally before Pat Tenizio died? Oh, this was all before Pat died. But um, this is, as far as I know, I don't believe these have been released before. Oh, okay, great. Looking forward to it. All right. I just learned that, that, that the Beatles to Bond and Bach is a reissue. It's not something brand new. So Okay, and it's been available, or it is available on CD? It's available on CD on Amazon. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. And there's one other uh, release with at least some peripheral Beatles interest in that it has a Beatles song on it. And Ken, you want to tell us about that? Uh, It's an album called Universal Love. Actually, let me clarify. We're not sure at this point if it's an EP or an album, but... um, The whole idea behind this album is that it takes a lot of uh, classic love songs and wedding songs, and they're reimagined to be uh, inclusive of the LGBT community. So what you have on this compilation, you have Ben Gibbard, who is the lead singer of Death Cab for Cutie. He covers And I Love Her, but he sings it as And I Love Him. And so all the cover versions here on this song, they switch the pronoun so that it, um, you know, it's, it's more about per, a person of the same sex. So um, we've seen a listing for this as an EP, but I've also seen an article that it's an LP. So we're not totally sure at this point about it. But Ben Gibbard uh, did perform And I Love Him on Conan O'Brien just mm-hmm. recently. So it sounded pretty good, too, doing it. Okay. All right, so is that it for news? I think so. Okay, so last week we uh, basically ran out of time by the time we got through um, Kit's um, Beatles picks of uh, underrated Beatles songs, and we still have the solo songs to do, which will be complicated slightly by the fact that Kit cheated by taking three Ringo songs. <laughs> but, um, but, but she has she has a <laughs> she has justification. Um so so um why don't we start with um do you want to start with the Ringo songs? Kit? Oh uh, sure we could do that. Yep now yep I, I swear I have justification for this that I kind of view these songs as as you know, going together. And what I'm talking about is, I guess you could call it the the Liverpool trilogy that uh, in in Ringo's most, uh, you know, recent uh, album, well, not most recent, but recent albums, he did a series of songs that were about growing up in Liverpool and, and his experiences. And what I find fascinating about them is they're certainly not all, you know, sunshine and and unicorns i mean it's it's uh sometimes a a pretty honest look at at uh you know growing up in liverpool um the first one he did which is my personal favorite is uh, liverpool eight which uh of course he he uh co-wrote with uh, dave stewart of uh, the eurythmics and it's you know i i think it's uh first of all very catchy i i think the the chorus you know just has a very catchy uh melody to it but also it's moving um, you know, I, I think it's it's particularly in the chorus, saying that, you know, he had to leave, that, uh, you know, that he, destiny was calling, I just couldn't stick around Liverpool, I left you, but I never let you down. Mm. Um, I, I just think that's a very moving 
uh, lyric. Um, and he goes, basically just tells the story about, uh, you know, playing with George and Paul and John and, and, you know, how hard they worked and all, but, uh, and then how they reached the top. But I think, you know, it's just wonderful, you know, at the end when he says, Liverpool, I left you, said goodbye to Admiral Grove. Um, you mm-hmm. know, and, I mean, it, they're just some wonderful references to, to Liverpool. So that's the, I, I'd say it's the song where he, he looks upon it more, you know, fondly. But then you get on the next album on Why Not, the other side of Liverpool. This is pretty different. You know, this is, again, this is not, not sunshine and, and rainbows. This is about, you know, wanting to get out of Liverpool, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> I mean, he says, you know, the, the other side of Liverpool is cold and damp, only way out of their drums, guitar, and amp. So this isn't strictly about, you know, wanting to, you know, looking at it with nostalgia. I mean, he says, my mother was a barmaid at the age of three. My father was gone. You know, it, it, it's an un, more of an unvarnished look. Uh, and, and the first time I heard this song, I was just so struck by it. You know, I, I just thought, wow. I mean, he's really being brutally honest here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like the backing singer, too. I, I like the, uh, by uh, Cindy Gomez, I believe, is, is the name of the, the, the female vocalist. I think she adds a little bit of bluesiness to it, which fits mm-hmm. in with the song. And then finally, we have uh, In Liverpool from uh, Ringo uh, 2012. This is a bit more back to the, the nostalgic you know, look, uh, of look back at, at Liverpool, you know, me and the boys, me and the gang living out our fantasies, breaking the rules, acting like fools. That's how it was for me. Um, you know, it's, uh, but, it, and, you know, we, and then uh, the other line I like too, the rain never stopped, but the sun always shone in my mind in, in Liverpool. So this is more of, I'd say a combination, both of those songs that, you know, acknowledging, yes, there were dark times, but ultimately he still has fondness for it. Also rocks a little harder. Um, than uh, than the previous songs, I think. And uh, I I just thought it was a fascinating trilogy, uh, looking back uh, at his life um, and and the, you know, multidimensional qualities of Liverpool. Mm -hmm. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Ken? Well, I I really, uh, I've always appreciated those three songs from Ringo. I know that he said that he's been asked if, he would ever write his own biography and he's declined to do so because according to him most people only care about seven years of his life so he wants to do his um talk about his history or his life in song instead it's just kind of ironic that all three songs here are about his childhood and the early years of the beatles because liverpool eight only takes you to shea stadium yeah so um but the thing that I like about all three songs, and this you could say about Ringo songs in general, is that his lyrics are very simple, but they're really heartfelt. And yeah. they, they, they're very powerful in their own way. I mean, you don't think of Ringo as a poet, but what he says can really grab you in the heart. And um, I love all three songs for that reason. You mentioned uh, a particular line in, in uh, the song in Liverpool, which I liked a lot. Me and the boys, me and the gang living our fantasies, breaking the rules, acting like fools. That's how it was for me. I also like how he asks, how was it for you? Yeah. (laughs) But um, he also says in there, um, he brings up his apprentice engineer job. And then he Mm -hmm. says, I had something very clear in my mind. Music was my goal in my heart and in my soul and in my mind. And um, it tells you a lot about him, that this was his love from the very beginning. And as he has said in many interviews... This is who he was. He was a musician. His goal in life was to make a living as a musician. He had no idea where the road would lead with him. But um, all three songs are very special in their own way, and I'm glad that he's done them. Very interesting in a way that all three songs, coincidentally, were co-written with Dave Stewart. Yeah. And... um, I would also point out, and I don't know if anybody else has even noticed this, but whenever I listen to In Liverpool, the melody in there kind of reminds me of Waterloo Sunset from the Kings, Hmm. if you listen very carefully. Don't ask me to sing, (laughs) but if you play play those two songs back-to-back, there's a similarity in there. Okay. Give that a try. All right. Yeah. (laughs) So, Steve, I thought the idea of doing doing the autobiographical songs was 
a, a good one. Mm-hmm. However, I don't. Uh, he basically, you know, he basically did it as as Kit said, as a substitute for writing the, a book. And even though he put out the picture book, which helped a little bit, uh, and he also had, and he also did the the uh, Grammy Museum exhibit, which contained a lot of stuff. I still wish we had something more and I had I wish he had gone a little further and even done you know uh, even a film or something uh, and talked about uh, his earlier days but um, I mean be that as it may I mean it's it's great that he he did this you know as he did um, but I would really I would I mean the songs themselves are great I think my favorite is other side of Liverpool I'm not sure why but but I really wish he had done something more. I think that I, I'm not going to say he dropped the ball because he obviously, I mean, it's up to, he, he can do what he wants to do, but I really wish uh, I would have loved to have heard his thoughts, especially given his multifaceted career, you know, before the Beatles and now what he's doing after I, you know, I, I wish he had done that, but anyway, no, I, and I agree. I think that's why I, too, I mean, Liverpool 8 is probably my number one, but, but Other Side of Liverpool is a very close number, too, mm-hmm. because it, it is, like you said, Steve, you know, you listen to that and you're like, boy, I'd love to hear more. You know, mm-hmm. I'd love to hear more about that side, you know, of, his, right. of how hard it was to, to, you know, growing up. So, I, you know, I think that's part of the attraction we both have to that song. Mm-hmm. And I think I think he's gotten to the point where, at this point in his life, he doesn't feel like he has to. And that's understandable. Yeah. That's understandable. There was a time when he was partying around in, in L.A. that maybe he he might have done it. But even then, it probably would have been more difficult at that point when he was you know hanging around with Harry. But, you know, he doesn't want to do it now, and that's fine. I just wish he, I just wish he had. Yeah. So I kind of wish that on the flip side of what you were saying, he would write songs about his later life. Well, Not just his mm-hmm. early life and oh, the Beatle sure. years. Yeah. So there's this fascination there in his solo career and all the work that he's done and all the people he worked with. Hmm. That yeah, would be, that I don't would know. Be I, I I don't know that I'd want to necessarily see a, a you know my life in song over seventy five you know tracks. <gasps> But um, <laughs> but he did but he did go a little further as it was just um, Steve wanted. Um, he did do Rory and the Hurricanes as well, so you could actually right. have cheated even more and had four. Right. I, almost okay. That's right. I almost did. I almost did. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Good point. Very close. If he had only put Liverpool in the title of that one, <laughs> it would have been yeah. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So you know there, there there is a fourth a fourth early look at that period. Um, I I could be wrong, um, but I seem to remember that when Liverpool Eight came out, the the single and the album, um, Ringo got into some trouble with a British TV interview he gave where when they asked him about Liverpool or maybe whether he was going to go back to Liverpool because it was made this. European city of culture that year or whatever, um, mm-hmm. and he said something like, "Oh no, I you know I I got out of there as soon as I could," and that got people in Liverpool really upset. Yes, it did. I yeah. remember that. And, that, and then, in fact, I remember the one the one uh, was it the uh, the Bush sculpture the the uh, the Bush sculpture of the Beatles that got uh, and his head got chopped off. I think it was. Ooh. Yeah, that, that's uh, right. Right. So, so yeah. I mean, it uh, it occurred to me, you know, listening to them, that perhaps the other side of Liverpool was almost a reaction to, you know, what what happened after Liverpool Eight came out, and he talked a little about it, and 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 he got so criticized, and it's as if he's saying, oh, oh you know what. I'll write a song about Liverpool, and it's the other side of it, okay? And, right. And that's yeah. what we have there. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And then maybe he felt better b- about that and, uh, and and decided to sort of write an, a nice one about Liverpool again. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, I was thinking when Steve was talking about, uh, you know, him doing a book um, and then about possibly doing songs about later in his life, too, if he were to do that, I'm sure that Genesis Books would be happy to... Uh, do something like I Me Mine where he's got the lyrics to all these songs and does commentary <laughs> under them and that would 
that oh, would wow. sort of that would sort of serve your uh you fill your dream here, Steve, because it would yeah, be you know all of the songs about Liverpool and growing up and his whole life and however far he goes, plus explanations about what's behind the does, ideas does... in the songs. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, but you know Genesis is still going on, and in fact, oh, yeah. the Ringo's yeah. books, Ringo's books um, are from the post Brian era, so you know very possible hey. <laughs> if only he were willing and wrote yeah. all those songs that would make it possible um, yeah. that that would be a dream for me actually Whatever well you let's go on to your poll choice and one thing that actually a couple of weeks ago I, I don't remember if it was on the show itself or when we were talking afterwards but ken mentioned that you actually got into the beatles because Paul worked with Michael Jackson, and you were into Michael Jackson first. Is that, is that right? True? Yeah, that's that um, is true. Yeah, it's it's kind yeah, of I'm... difficult for an old guy like me to imagine that. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> I was an '80s kid, you know. Same, I was an same 80s here. Kid. And uh, you know, I was an '80s kid, and you know, at, at the time it was you know early '80s. Uh, Michael Jackson was, of course, the biggest thing. And I mean, I. I mean, gotta say, I knew who Paul was. I knew who the Beatles were. It wasn't like it was completely foreign to me. But I didn't really get into his music until I remember "Say Say Say" came out, and that made me buy "Pipes of Peace." Uh-huh. And mm. uh, and then it all was all you know. That was I don't want to say all downhill from there because it was it was all well, uphill from or there. Or you could say, <laughs> and now it's all this. <laughs> And now so, it's all there. There you go. There you go. Did so maybe yeah. we should point out as well, since we didn't last week, we we mentioned your songs we were singing book, but we didn't mention that you've also written the Michael Jackson fact. Yes, indeed, I have. Yeah, and it's a it's a look at at his just his music. It's not really a, a biography. It's it's about his artistic career. You know, mm-hmm. uh, career. So. Right. Mm-hmm. And so your underrated Paul song is. It is um, Riding to Vanity Fair, uh, which, you know, to be honest, uh, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard was a, was a, an album I, I had to kind of warm up to it. I don't know why. Uh, there was just something about it that, that initially didn't click with me. But Riding to Vanity Fair, this just stood out for me. It just was so different from what Paul usually records. I mean, not that he always records, you know, coming up, but, uh, <laughs> but he, this one, this one was just so dark uh, mm. and, and highly personal. I mean, you could tell he wouldn't say who it was for, although he said, in, uh, I think it was an interview with Paul DeNoyer, it was not aimed at Heather. Um, and and uh, so, okay. Um, so it was, it was some <laughs> other, <laughs> It was some other friend of his, he said, and he wouldn't go any further than that. But interestingly, he claimed it was more about sorrow than anger. And I disagree. Uh, When you read some of the lyrics, I mean, you know, why pretend I think I've heard enough of your familiar song uh, to tell you what I'm going to do? I'll try to take my mind off new. And now that you don't need my help, I'll use the time to think about myself. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. And, and I'm saying you don't fool anyone. I mean, there's, there's some real anger uh, running uh, through the song and it's just so unlike, uh, but I like it because it does reveal a more personal side that I don't think he visits enough. Uh, you know, doesn't reveal, uh, you know, he tends to, you know, not uh, want to keep some things uh, uh, hidden. And um, the arrangement I like a lot. It's very moody and but sparse um and you know with his his voice like much of on uh, chaos and creation you know his voice is right up front in the mix i mean you can you know he's almost right up to the microphone like he's you know it's like a conversation it, just all around i think this was a welcome uh break from from you know his usual um stuff which is great but uh but i just like this this difference in in sound and theme Okay, Ken, what do you feel? Oh, I think this is a brilliant song, and it's when I think of uh, riding to Vanity Fair, the word that comes to mind is haunting. Mm-hmm. I don't know how anyone who listens to the words cannot think it's about Heather, and maybe Paul was saying what he did to protect her at the time, but mm-hmm. um, it's just they're highly personal. 
and it, it shows how he was hurt in a relationship. And for people who think that Paul doesn't bear his soul enough, you listen to a song like this and you wish that he would do more of it. You know, right. Paul tends to be very upbeat, very positive in life. And that's one of the things we love about him. That's how he is in his interviews. But once in a while, there are those very sad moments in his songs, and people are drawn to that. But this one, I mean, there's a lot of verses in here. Mm -hmm. It's not like uh, one of the, the shorter Beatles songs that are brilliant, like For No One or something like that. This one has a lot of verses, and it says a lot about this relationship. And it's very easy when you listen to these words to attach it or believe that it has to be about Heather. What was the, there was a line in here, the definition of friendship apparently ought to be showing support for the one that you love, and I was open to friendship, but you didn't seem to have any to spare while you were riding to Vanity Fair. I mean, there's some real powerful words in there, and just the very simple arrangement with those two notes that keep playing against, you know, that keep repeating throughout the song, it is, uh, it's very striking and very haunting to me. And um, it's it's kind of tough to listen to if you're used to happy-go-lucky Paul. But um, I'm really glad that he put this one out. I, I do think the song is really brilliant. Okay, Steve. Interesting that, that uh, you guys seem to think it's, it's, uh, it's all about Heather. Um, in doing a little bit of looking around, one place I found thought it was about Jeff Baker, his former publicist. Mm. And that same place also, uh, in, a, in a, another paragraph, thought it might also be about John Lennon. So, uh, you know, it, uh, you could probably find, uh, you know, uh, you could probably interpret the, the lyrics, you know, many different ways. Yeah. But as far as the lyrics go, I mean, those are those are not McCartney McCartney type lyrics. They're no. really they're really really biting, and I'm not used mm -hmm. to seeing not used to seeing that from Paul McCartney. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, the fact that this one, you know, is not that not that well known. It's kind of it's kind of weird that it isn't because it's so different. I mean, it reminds me of um, How Do You Sleep? You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of that kind of that. Uh, type of thing um but um i don't know it's 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 definitely unique let's put it that way so alan yeah um i sort of lean more towards the heather interpretation um, yeah. you know keeping in mind that, well just because of that uh verse about um, the definition of friendship apparently ought to be showing support for the one that you love. I mean, right. okay, you can, right. you can love your friend, but um, that seems to you know point that way. I mean, you can right. hear it as being about John, but he's always maintained that that was a real friendship, and so much of this is about how it this friendship turned out not to be a real friendship. I kind of think that the John model doesn't fit you mm -hmm. know, as angry no, I, as they I, both got. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there's, there, I, no, I agree that it it sounds a lot like Heather. I'm just saying that there are others out yeah. there that think differently. Yeah, the you Jeff know, I Baker don't one, I think, may give Jeff Baker too much importance in his life. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they were tied at, at a certain point. Um, I mean, I know that when um, Jeff used to call me to. Uh, promote an interview for one of Paul's projects, he would say, oh, yeah, it's Jeff Baker. God wants <laughs> to speak to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Did he really? Yes, he really. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> and that was wow. about Standing Stone, of all things. But um, anyway. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, I can totally understand, Kit, why it took you a long time to warm up to Chaos and Creation. I, I, I haven't got there yet. Um, it took me a long time, so you'll, you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, you know, this is uh, this is, as everyone here seems to agree, a very unusual Paul McCartney song because he does tend to be the sunnier, uh, you know, one who, you know, the closest he's got to being critical of someone else in a song, I think, is maybe too many people, you know, um, and even that was 
done so poetically that you almost needed John to say in you know his Rolling Stone interview, well, what do you mean too many people going underground? You know, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> took your mm-hmm. lucky break and broke it in two. What are you saying there, Paul? You know, I mean, right. I'm, I'm not sure that I necessarily would have heard it as an attack on John without reading John's interpretation of it, but maybe I would have, I don't know. Um, John yeah. did make a, you know, did actually bring more attention to that aspect of it than the song itself did. But this, yeah, this is right out there and it is unusual. And I think anything on Chaos and Creation is could probably almost fit into the overlooked category. So, or, um, so except for maybe like, Fine Line, maybe. Yeah. Except for Fine Line. Yeah, maybe. Only because that was the single. Yeah. Only because, yeah. yeah. You know, one, one thing, I think that, that maybe the key for the interpretation of the song is riding to Vanity Fair. Those That phrase. Yeah, and and I mean we could sit here and speculate what what exactly that means, but I think that's probably the key, you know, rather than the, a lot of the rest of the lyrics. But. Yeah, because it doesn't seem to make sense if you know it. So it yeah. has to mean something, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. unless simply the word vanity in there is a you know he's using it that way and decided to sort of make it into Vanity Fair. Uh, you, you know, we could be. We don't know, but. Mm-hmm. Could be. I, I kind of interpret it as meaning while you are on your way to becoming more famous. Mm. You know? Oh. Mm. You know. So you're so you're falling into the Heather you're falling into the Heather interpretation. Well, I've always believed that it was. Okay. But until until Paul admits it, we can't say hundred percent. Could, could be Eric Stewart or Elvis Costello. Yeah. Well, there you go. Mm. Let's start some rumors, man. I think I think I think we need to do a third episode where we just take this whole thing apart. And, okay. You know. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um. So, shall we go to your John solo selection? Sure. Uh, this one, yeah. And I'm trying to remember. I I had a conversation about this song with somebody, and and I uh, you know. It's, it's a song that some people love, some people don't. Um, uh, from Imagine, I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. And I like it for the very reason that this friend of mine didn't, which is it's a little sloppy. You know, like it's it's a little, it, it's not as polished as, say, Imagine. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it has a looser jam kind of feel to it. And that's what I like. It's, it's uh uh, it just sounds so different than a lot of the other uh, tracks on that album. Um, it's it's gritty. It's 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 you know bluesy, and uh, you know I I just think even though the lyrics, I mean they're they're fairly simple in a way. I mean if they were just sort of, I believe they were just sort of improvised in in a way around this jam, but. You know, it's it's interesting how the song progresses when he sings, oh, I don't want to be a soldier, mama, I don't want to die, I don't want to be a sailor, mama, I don't want to fly, I don't want to be a failure, mama, I don't want to cry, I don't want to be a soldier. I mean, it's it's just interesting to see where he goes uh, with, and, and we could probably go to town analyzing this as well, but, uh, but I, I just think it's... Um, you know, it's biting great vocal performance from him too. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, he just, and the, the, uh, flux fiddlers, uh, I like that kind of shaky kind of string, you know, this, the, when the shaky strings come in, uh, you know, it adds a little more tension to the song. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, John is, is both, I, he's not raging angry. I mean, it, it's not, how do you sleep? You know, it's not on that level, but, uh, but it's obviously, I mean, he's, he's, protesting um you know uh, uh, vietnam or however you want to uh however you want to interpret it but it it just has this as i said this sloppy quality to it that i i just love and it's you know a rant against expectations of society oh and king curtis of course playing mm-hmm. sax solo uh short before he died great solo um you know it just pierces through the 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 noise and it's um uh, yeah, I mean, gosh, all star group here: Nicky Hopkins, Joey Mullen, Klaus Vormann, Jim Keltner. I mean, it's 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 just a star line. Oh, and George Harrison, of course, on slide guitar. Tom, uh, yeah. Tom, Tom Evans, Mike P- Mike Pinder, Mike Pinder. Yep. Yep. I mean, on you know, tambourine. Right. 
yeah. I mean, what a what a top uh, you know jam session here. And then and and you've got Phil Spector doing the Wall of Sound. I mean, yes, that's right. And so I I just think even though it's it's not as polished, I I, I just think it has its own resonance, uh, and I've always gravitated toward it. Mm-hmm. Okay. What do you think, Ken? This is a song that took me the longest time to appreciate because it, it was it's atypical yeah. of John Lennon's music. I mean, what I what I like about it now is that, as you said, Kit, it's loose. It is a jam. It's so it's kind of improvisational. And most of John Lennon's solo work from Imagine On or Plastic Ono Band On is structured, you know, and um, when I think about this, I think about like when. John and Yoko and uh, Frank Zappa did well, baby, please don't go. And it was like a loose jam or the stuff that that John did with Yoko. You know, don't worry, Mm -hmm. Kyoko, and the live stuff right there. The fact that, you know, it's not what you're used to hearing from John. It goes on for about five, six minutes. And like you said, the the star studded cast, George Harrison doing the slide guitar. I, I like it now more for that reason. Mm-hmm. It just sounds very different from most of John Lennon's solo work. So I appreciate it more now for that reason. But it was one of the few, you know, there's only that one and, and uh, Angela, which I know I said before on this show is like the only song from John. I don't really care for it too much mm-hmm. in his solo career. But uh, it was this one for a while. But now I've really grown to like it and look mm-hmm. at it in a different way. Yep. Uh Steve? The one thing that's always hit me about the song is the is the grittiness of it. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, you know John's songs were generally, and I and I use I guess I have to say that generally because you can probably come up with a few that aren't, but generally they were relatively you know polished, relatively studio. No, I wouldn't say studio slick, but they were you know you could tell they were. He didn't generally like things that were that loose i know you guys use the term loose but he generally had the whole thing together and this one is one of those songs where it just kind of it's it's very gritty and very and, and it is loose loose i guess is a good term to use i'm not sure if if it's one of my particular favorites i do like the lyrics though um Ooh. i i you know um reminds me of you know plastic ono band how personally he got there and so, but uh, and of course, and mentioning all those people that were on there, I, Mike Pinder. I mean, Mike Pinder, um, one of the Moody Blues played on there. Uh, you know, two members of Badfinger, Klaus. I'm sorry, Klaus, Klaus was on there. Um, I mean, King King Curtis. I mean, that that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. So, but um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, for that for the fact that it's a kind of a loose song, and it's kind of gritty. Um, so it's it it's a good song. Okay, yeah, I think um, apart from the fact that probably the King Curtis was an overdub, I think we heard enough of the uh, of that on the Lost Lennon tapes to know because there were several attempts at, at his solo. But leaving that aside for a minute, and 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 imagining that they actually played this sort of loose jammy piece together in a room which you know probably the basis of it was i kind of think it had to be really a trip to be sitting in that room listening to that jam it just has that kind of quality where you know that it just would have been an enveloping sound simple as the song is and i think that the recording to a really good degree captures that, you know, it's not mm-hmm. quite the same as sitting in there, but we're not going to have that opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> even if we develop time travel, I, th- I think that as a song on one hand, uh, for me, there's is an association between, I don't want to be a soldier and I want you. She's so heavy. I mean, they're very different songs Ooh. in every way, but they both, you know, are very repetitive. Um, and go on for quite a while, maybe more than the material can sustain, and yet that creates a kind of hypnotic atmosphere that keeps you enveloped in it, you know? Um, Mm. So um, otherwise, as a song, I mean, I kind of think it it almost belongs more on um, Sometime in New York City, 
You know, I mean, thematically it fits. It's a it's an anti war protest song, and uh, uh, although I, I imagine if he did it on some time in New York City, it, it would have been on like an acoustic guitar and you know maybe less jammy. But uh, yeah, okay, it's a, a, a interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. I, I like how, how you compared that with I Want You, She's So Heavy. Yeah, um, that did not occur to me, but it makes sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. it does. Although I Want You, She's So Heavy is so much more a tighter mm-hmm. recording. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's structured differently, and it's more developed in a lot of ways. Um, but but still, I don't know why, for some reason, those two songs seem to go together for me. I don't know why. Okay. That cool. leaves us with George Harrison's solo. Yes, indeed. And uh, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to use a word to describe uh, George in this that I think probably not many people would use normally, which is funky. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't really think of George Harrison as being funky, but, uh, but this is uh, Woman Don't You Cry For Me. From by the way, my my probably my favorite George Harrison solo album, other than All Things Must Pass, thirty three and a third. I love that album. Hard to pick one song from that album, but I picked this one because it is such a departure from for George. Even though George, you know, was certainly a devotee of R and B. I mean, you know, you can tell from um, Beatle days, and and he's talking. To, I mean, you know, gosh, one of, of course one of the the songs, you know, Pure Smoky. <laughs> I mean, he's mm-hmm. you know he's clearly versed in R and B. Uh, but he didn't visit it as much uh, as he should have, I, I think. And uh, and Woman, Don't You Cry For Me is an, uh, is an example. I mean, just from the moment it starts with that funky Willie Weeks bass. Oh, I mean, he, that is so good. Um, mm. You know, you just think, this is a George Harrison song? You know, I mean, then the, when the guitars come in, uh, it sounds a bit, you know, a little twangy. And so it sounds a little more... Uh, like a George song, but it's it's just such a, a really cool departure. Um, he uh, apparently wrote it while he was on that Delaney and Bonnie uh, tour. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Delaney uh, Bramlett handed him a, a bottleneck slide guitar at one point, and he began to play around with it. And apparently, that's how he started, you know, toying with the idea of the song. And uh, it's it's just uh, an amazing jam session. And and by the way, as we talked about, you know, the great players on uh, "I Don't Want to Be a Soldier," you had some great ones on here too. Tom, the great Tom Scott uh, is, is on here. Uh, Willie Weeks, as I mentioned, I found that David Foster was on this. I'd forgotten that uh, when he was back when he was a you know a studio musician. Uh, mm-hmm. Before he really became known as a producer, but um, I just think the lyrics uh, very interesting. I mean, he throws in occasional spiritual references in there. I mean, you know, there's just one thing I got to see. That's the Lord. Got to keep him in sight. I mean, he throws that in, but but uh, you know, a lot of it is is just you know, kind of a you know, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it, but but sort of a breakup song in a way. Um, and uh, it's it's just in- interesting. I mean, in some ways, the, even the opening lines, I'm going to leave you here, I'm going to leave you at the station. I don't know, a little bit uh, one after 909-ish, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> perhaps uh, going back to that. But I just love the, the just, as I said, the the difference in, in style. It's just something that George did not do. Uh, very often, and and I wish he had he'd gone uh, and done it more. And his vocals are terrific on this, by the way. Uh, you know, he can he can carry off his own brand of funk. <laughs> it's it's really uh, impressive. So this has been just a personal favorite of mine. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, Ken. Well, oddly enough, Kit, funky is a word that I've described several times on the radio for some of George's music. Yeah. This is definitely one of them. I, I always think of Wreck of the Hesperus as being very, very funky. Maya Love falls into that category for me. But I've always loved this song, and it's one of my all-time favorite opening tracks for any album. The yes. way that the drums kick in from Alvin Taylor. Mm-hmm. And um, it is kind of different in, in the lyrics as you were saying, um, you know, about dumping this woman, you know, having no feelings for her, you know, doesn't want mm-hmm. attachment. So different from everything else that George writes about. Has a very different feel to it. I love it for that reason. And a lot of mm-hmm. slide guitar work throughout the song, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, 
good opening upbeat number. And uh, interesting to note that he was considering uh, having this song on All Things Must Pass. He was yeah. working the song at that time, and there's an early version of it that's on Early Takes, Volume 1, which has mm-hmm. different lyrics, too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Not nearly as developed as it is on 33 and a third. But yeah, it's really an outstanding track. Mm-hmm. I think if he wrote it on the Delaney and Bonnie tour, it could be mm-hmm. Patty. Mm-hmm. You know, that's and... one of the theories, yeah. That's one of the theories behind it. Yeah, mm. and that's a little atypical for him in the way that the you know writing to Vanity Fair is atypical for Paul. You know, he's he never really overtly said very much about that relationship, other than you know we were both done. You know, so yeah, I mean it, it could just be, of course, a song about nobody in particular. Um, mm-hmm. I think the spiritual aspect you mentioned may be less. George Harrison's spirituality, you know, as we know it <laughs> through a lot of his work, than a sort of reflexive gospel, gospel spirituality, just because the song is so bluesy at mm-hmm. heart that, you know, blues and gospel sort of go together in a way, and, and, and lines True. like that are, are pretty typical in, you know, in, in sort of certain kinds of blues. I wasn't crazy about the produced version of the track on the album. Now that the first takes version is out, I like that much, much better just because, you know, he's playing an acoustic guitar and he's playing it in a really interesting, intricate way. Um, Mm -hmm. I I just love the playing on that acoustic demo. Um, But yeah, it's funky and it's, you know, it's it's a certain kind of thing that, you know, is... (laughs) <laughs> well, I get into this a lot, and Ken and I always disagree, but, but it, it, it sounds to me like the production of its time that mm-hmm. um, I, I kind of suspect that if he were revisiting that album now, it might have a lighter touch. Mm, interesting. <laughs> but maybe not. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> um, I, 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 think, I think, again, going back to the... To, uh, I don't want to be a soldier. This is, you know, very atypical George Harrison, and I like it. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, so it's lighthearted. I mean, it, and I would put my money that probably it does have something to do with Patty, but at the same time, it's also so lighthearted. If it was about Patty, it would be, you know, it it doesn't sound like the George that we all think we know, which we may not know in the first place, but. I do like it. It's it's a it's a great song. Um, it's you know, like I said, it's very lighthearted. That's about all I can say. It's 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 just well done. Uh, so and and I just want to mention, I um, uh, Ken made a really good point too. Yeah, really one of the best album opening tracks mm-hmm. of, yeah. of the solo. I mean, it was just from the moment you you hear that, you just think this is going to be. A, a, a special album i mean there's just something about it you know the way it's it just i mean it start. even though the lyrics aren't exactly upbeat <laughs> in a way mm. i mean you know as soon as you're as you said the drums and then the bass kick in it, it just grabs your attention immediately and you just think this is going to be an interesting listen you know right and uh so yeah, yeah I, I i just thought that was a really good point just a, that was a a genius opening track really fits mm-hmm. just perfect you yeah. know in that role Mm-hmm. Okay, so th- those were all of the solo songs, right? We didn't miss anything, did we? Nope, that was nope. it. That was it. Apologize. Right, okay. And that brings us to the end of another episode of Things We Said Today. And it's been great hearing Kit's choices for overlooked tracks for both the Beatles last week and the solo Beatles this week and it's um, given us a chance to sort of revisit these tracks and think about them uh, in a different way and um, I've enjoyed hearing the other three of you uh, your opinions um, which you know may have changed my mind about a couple of things too and I hope that it's the same for our listeners Uh, so you can reach us at uh, if you want to send us an email which we 
always read and try when we can to respond to. We have a, an email address, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter with the at symbol things we said fab. We have a Facebook page, things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And you can reach Steve at Beatles Examiner at gmail.com. And I have a Facebook Beatles news page called Beatles News and Information that uh, everybody is welcome to join. Okay. And Kit, how can people reach you? Uh, you can reach me through my website, uh, kiddotool.com. Uh, you can also reach me on Twitter uh, at kiddotool and on Facebook. And the page is called Kiddo Tools Keynotes. So, Ken, how do people reach you? You can always email me at everylittlething at att.net. And uh, my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. A couple of things I want to mention very quickly. I did an interview with Jude Kessler, who's known for her series of narrative books on John Lennon. And we talked about pretty much the same thing we talked about on these last two shows, overlooked songs from John Lennon's career in particular. And we discuss a few of his Beatles songs and a few of his solo songs. And that's right there on my website. And don't forget, I'm continuing this week with my special contest in which you can win two of Kiddo Tools books, songs who are singing guided tours through the Beatles' lesser known tracks and her book on Michael Jackson called Michael Jackson FAQ plus a Kiddo Tool tote bag. And that's all on my website. And uh, find out all the details right there on the homepage at KenMichaelsRadio.com. That's it. And you can reach me through Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. So for Ken Michael, Steve Marinucci, and Kid O'Toole, uh, this is Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.